Hey there, today I'm going to be going over the last two X-Men in this wave that I haven't talked about quite yet. My name is Nate, and welcome to the Gamers Guild. The time has finally come for more of my favorite mutants to hit the table to round out that sweet 90s nostalgia. And one of them has been one I've been excited for since day one, and the other one is cool too, I guess. Let me know down in the comments below which one you think I am more excited for between the Russian and the Cajun. You might be able to tell just by me talking about them, but I don't know. Uh, before we dive in, though, I do want to give a couple shout-outs to the guild sponsors, Tritex Games, based in the EU, and War Room Hobbies, based here in Tennessee. Both are great local gaming stores that have game nights at their stores and are supporting their local communities. So, if you are shopping online anyways, please consider using them as an option to support an LGS instead of a big warehouse company. And to help beat those prices, though, I do have some codes that will save you even more off of these stores' already discounted prices. If you use the code TRITEXGGCP5 at checkout, you will save an extra 5% off of your order uh, from Tritex's MCP selection. And if you check out at War Room Hobbies, you can use the code MCP2022 for an extra 10% off of your order. And if you already are shopping from your LGS, that's awesome. Keep supporting them. We understand. But if you're wanting to have a way to support the Guild's videos and podcasts, check out our Patreon page. For as little as a dollar a month or $12 a year, you help us continue to put out content for Marvel Crisis Protocol as podcast, YouTube, and hopefully some other formats coming soon. We also have a monthly giveaway thanks to Tritex. All you need to do to enter is be subscribed to the channel and leave a comment on a video the same month that video was released. And with a new month here, there will be a winner drawn at the end for a non-Ultimate Encounter MCP expansion. Now, enough about all that, let's start talking about Colossus, aka Pitor Rasputin. He has 6 stamina, moves short, but on a 50mm base, is size 3 for 4 threat. He has a physical defense of 4, 3 energy, and 3 mystic. His first attack is a, well, a physical strike, with a range of 2, strength of 5, and costs nothing. He will gain power equal to the damage dealt, and on a wild, you trigger concussive force. After this attack is resolved, the target character loses one power. So because this is after the attack is resolved, and let's say you only deal one damage but roll a wild, well, they'll lose the power they had just gained. Another neat interaction here is that if you have given your opponent just enough power for a counter strike or any other kind of reactive ability, concussive force will get to trigger first, denying your opponent the chance to do anything. The final thing I will say here is it's really gross if you attack into someone with the stun special condition. And speaking of, his next attack is also a physical range 2 attack. X-Slam has the strength of 7 for a cost of 3. And speaking of stun, the enemy character is guaranteed to be stunned. And if you rolled a wild, they will also gain the stagger special condition. So, a pretty nice spender. One guaranteed status effect and one that is pretty likely, and some extra dice on top of all that. His superpowers are where he really gets to find, though. He only has one active power, and that is playing catch. It costs 3 power and lets him choose an interactive terrain feature of size 3 or less, and within range 2 and hurls it medium. Like most other throws, this one has a limit of once per turn. And I have some thoughts on this, and I feel like the throw should have been able to target characters as well, but I'll talk more about that in the roundup. He then has two reactive powers. The first is Big Brother. It costs two, and it allows him to become the target of an attack for another allied character that is within range two, regardless of range and line of sight. So, basically, Bodyguard. His second ability is Bozomoi, or Oh My. It also costs two power and can be used when Colossus is targeted by a physical or energy attack. He then gets to roll two extra dice in that defense roll. So, if you're starting to think of a certain shield-wielding Avenger, well, you aren't far off. Finally, we have Organic Steel, which lets Colossus reduce the amount of damage he would take from an enemy effect by 1 to a minimum of 1, and he's immune to bleed. He also has some changes on his injured side. His stamina goes up to 7, and Bozmoy becomes an innate power that now reads, when defending against physical or energy attacks, this character adds blanks in its defense roll to its total successes. 
So he kind of has the inverse of Black Panther's Vibranium Armor, where he count blanks on the front and gets to roll extra dice on the back. Unfortunately, Colossus doesn't get to both add dice and count blanks at the same time, like Steve Rogers. But he is still a really, really durable bodyguard. As a matter of fact, he is probably all in all more durable than Steve. He has two more points of stamina, along with the damage reduction, that I think is the real key to any character that who wants to be tanky. So, with all of this said, what he is going to do well and where he is lacking. Well, like I said, he is a tank, and not just a tank for the sake of being durable like Lizard, he is a tank with bodyguard. So he will probably make sure that your key members can stay alive, while probably not getting too beat up in the process. Unfortunately, this is where I have to stop talking about the things that he is good at. And to be fair, Steve used to have a lot of the same problems as Metal Man here until the 1.5 update. So if you were an avid Avengers player, you may already have seen some of the issues Colossus is going to run into. First is power generation. In order for Colossus to gain power, he needs to punch people or take damage. And while trying to avoid the taking damage part, Unfortunately, he can only gain power at range 2, so he needs to be in the thick of it, which is where he shines anyway. But the X-Men's squishier members already like staying away from the front line. Domino, Storm, etc. Which is where you want your bodyguard to be able to be. His attacks are okay, all things considering, and have some great triggers. But only moving short is going to hinder him getting somewhere he in getting to attack, with only range 2 attacks in addition to that short move. The other slight problem with him is that the one thing he is really good at is very disruptible. Whether it is a push, throw, or advance, there are plenty of superpowers that can either get the character you want to bodyguard out of reach, or just move the bodyguard out of position so that they can't do anything. So again, that short move just hurts even more when any form of positioning disruption happens is basically a stagger to Colossus. He is coming with a tactic card in the form of Indomitable that will help with getting pushed or thrown out of place, though, which is quite handy. So I will admit, I really wish that Colossus had one of two changes to help keep him a little bit more relevant on the board. A medium move, or his throw to be able to displace enemy characters to both give him some control, but also more versatile damage output. Thankfully though, some of the affiliations he is a part of do help answer some of those problems. First is the expected X-Men. Storm's leadership with the hop is perfect for the big guy since he is slow himself and is on a bigger base. X-Force, where we first got our Colossus T's, may not actually be the best place outside of the tactic card that lets him team up with Wolverine for their iconic fastball special. And the affiliation that I had not at all expected, but am probably the most excited for for Colossus is Brotherhood. Now, admittedly, I'm not too aware of any of the times that he has spent with Magneto or Mystique, but he is a welcome addition, and it helps with his power generation problem, ensuring that he can keep on bodyguarding your high-value characters like Scarlet Witch and Magneto, or squishy objective runners like Toad and Quicksilver. So all in all, Colossus is even above Black Dwarf in his overall durability, and a bodyguard to boot but at the cost of some extra utility that some of his home affiliations can thankfully help balance out. Outside of his home affiliations, I can see some appeal for a team like Midnight Suns, where there aren't too many durable characters, so they take advantage of his bodyguard ability. And Bump from the Leadership will also help Colossus stay near his charge. Now let's talk about Gambit. He has the alter ego of Remy Labou, has 5 stamina, moves medium, is size 2, all for 3 threat. He has threes across the board on defense. His first attack, though, is a physical bow staff. It has a range of two, strength of four, for no cost. It will gain Remy a guaranteed power, and on a wild, it will let him push the target character away short as long as they are size three or less before damage is dealt. And I have to say, I always like seeing a guaranteed power generation on four dice attacks. And the bonus push can certainly come in handy. Uh, next up is his Kinetic Ace. It has a range of 3, strength of 5, 4, 0 power. This one will gain him power equal to the damage dealt, and on a wild, trigger explosive. This will deal out damage to other enemy characters within range 2 before damage is dealt to the actual target. So, an extra builder with a bit more range, more dice, and the chance for a boom. What is there not to love here? 
Uh, I will clarify uh, something real quick because I have seen some questions come up about it, and that is that the explosive damage being dealt gaining him power. And in short, the answer is no. When an attack gains a character power equal to the damage dealt, it is only referring to the attack, which is offensive dice, versus the def defensive dice and how much damage is dealt from that. Any additional effects on an attack are just that, they're additional effects. So whether that is Thor's Strike, where he can start throwing people around, or here with Gambit's Explosive Trigger, uh, just doesn't work, unfortunately. Which does lead us, though, to Gambit's final attack, 52 card pickup, which is always fun for the person doing it, but never fun for everyone else who had to be picking up the cards. And that's true for this attack as well. It is a beam 4 energy attack with a strength of 5 for a cost of 4. As well, thanks to Flurry of Cards, each wild in the attack roll will count as two successes instead of just the normal one. So with a lucky roll, Gambit can really dish out some damage with this attack. And Remy, being who he is, well, he has some ways to make his own luck. His first superpower is Accelerate Charge. It costs three power and will let him add two dice to any attack rolls for his next attack action. Which means if he uses this alongside his beam, all of those attacks will get a buff similar to Storm and Iron Man's superpower buffs. So it can seem a bit pricey, but once Gambit starts getting enough power to accelerate his kinetic ace, you should start seeing a decent return on investment in damage in addition to power gain. Additionally, to help his attacks, he has a reactive, a little something extra. It only costs one power, and it can be used after Gambit has rolled an attack. He may then change one hit result into a wild. And this is where Gambit begins to make a little bit of his own luck. Now, granted, if you roll a wild naturally, this isn't a huge deal for those first two attacks. But if you're looking for the explosive trigger or the push, this gives you a 3-in-1 chance per die roll to get that wild instead of just the 1-in-8. And on the 52 card pickup, it basically is spend a power to gain an extra success. Which may not sound like a lot, but pushing through one extra damage can always be a big deal. Especially in this game. And he does have one semi-defensive power in the form of Parting Shot. Uh, I mean, Enhanced Agility. Like Parting Shot, it costs 2 power and can be used after an attack targeting Gambit has been resolved. The attacker suffers 1 damage, then this character may advance away from the attacking character short. So, handy to have if he manages to get hit pretty hard and live with the possibility of getting out of attack range, and at the very least, closer to your allies and safety. He doesn't have any changes on his injured side that are worthy of note. So, where does this leave our Master Thief? and all in all in a pretty interesting position. Gambit has the same, and I'll put this into air quotes, problem that every other baseline three threat character has that in he is not very durable. So at this point, it's not really an issue so much as a known factor that characters with five stamina and threes across the board without some sort of defensive power like martial artist or something like that uh, just aren't very durable. So, without holding that against Gambit, he has a lot of utility to him. And as long as he has power, that has some pretty much guaranteed utility. I say this because if you roll four dice, the chance of you getting at least one wild in the roll is around 45%. The chance of you hitting one hit is around 70%. Which means a majority of the time, Gambit should get his size 3 push off with his bow staff. And those percentages only grow with more dice, so adding an extra 2 from Accelerate is really nice when you are trying to get that push or maybe the explosive trigger. Basically, if someone is alive on 2 health, the better way to finish them off might be 2 kinetic ace attacks at a character that is within range 2 to finish them off with the explosive triggers, because Gambit will be extremely consistent because of a little something extra. So, if that's good, and it's a pretty good good, What's the bad? Well, Gambit doesn't have anything in the way of mobility unless you count Enhanced Agility, which is like got a little asterisk to it if you do. And because he will want to be spending his power pretty frequently for extra dice or little something extra, he might find himself a bit power starved early in the game. That said, I think once he gets roughed up a bit and is able to start charging some of his kinetic aces, he should be able to be just fine on that front. 
But just in case not, Gambit 2 has joined the ranks of the Brotherhood, and Magneto can feed power into Gambit so that he can blow up the board with his playing cards. Gambit is also, as expected, an X-Men. And I don't think he has one leader he's going to prefer over the other when it comes to the X-Men. Getting to more easily do the combo of charge and 52 card pickup will be a lot easier with Cyclops, but getting cover and staying at range 3 with Storm also has some serious health benefits for Gambit. Outside of his home affiliations, and really probably the best affiliation for Gambit, is going to be the Cabal. While Gambit does have a bit of control with his bow staff, he is primarily a damage dealer that relies on his power to keep that consistent. And, well, hello Red Skull. Gambit does also have a couple of personalized tactic cards, one of which can't even be played alongside his fellow heroic mutants, but grants everyone else within range 3 of him stealth, and that could be really handy. And Charming Thief basically gives Gambit the Soul Gem for a turn as another way to possibly build up a lot of power which he can pretty quickly spend. But these card spots are going to be highly contested both in Brotherhood and X-Men because there are already so many great ones in those affiliations. And that is all I have for today regarding these two. So now I will throw it over to my future self to get a random winner for Tritex's giveaway. Alright, and here we are loaded up uh, with the comment picker. And so congratulations to Declan Rubin. Very excited about Juggy. Uh, assuming this is coming from the Juggernaut video. He's out in less than a week at this point, and I am extremely excited. Uh, congratulations, and I will be reaching out shortly. Well, again, congratulations, and if you want to enter into this month's giveaway, you can start by leaving a comment on this video as your first entry. And if you have enjoyed my thoughts and are new to the channel, hit that subscribe button for a weekly dose of MCP content in the form of reviews, battle reports, and you can also find the Gamers Guild podcast on several different podcast apps and platforms. Uh, I, I guess, I don't really, I'm still new to all that. Uh, but thank you all for watching, and until next time, keep on gaming.